Welcome to the Strategy Mom Podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me on another episode of Strategy Mob. That's my radio announcer voice, guys. Was it good? Did it sound okay? Yeah, like yeah absolutely. Flat. Guys, I'm sorry. The jokes don't get any better than this. Thanks, though. Appreciate it. <laughs> hey, um, today I am I'm joined by two amazing gentlemen that we, we we met on LinkedIn. So, you know, man, LinkedIn's great for connections, right? I mean, I watched uh, Jeff Hunter's video today. He was talking about that. And, you know, man, it's just I met I created some really deep connections on LinkedIn. So guys, thanks for taking the time to jam with me. But I have the oh so famous Bowtie Terrence today and the one and only Benny Mazer. Um with, <laughs> with us. <laughs> Hey guys, for everyone out there who's watching and listening right now and kind of don't know who you fine gentlemen are and how you guys got started off in the industry, I think it'd be cool to kick off this podcast with a couple origin stories. So, Mr. Bowtie Terrence, um, how in the world did you get started in this crazy little world we call the automotive automotive industry? Oh, man. Well, I got started because I was uh, at the moment driving a big wheelers, eight, I mean, big trucks, 18 wheelers. And uh, I had a background in finance. You know, I sold life insurance. I was sold, I had sold uh, retirement products and um, I've always been a numbers guy. And a uh, buddy of mine said his cousin was doing pretty good in finance, you know, working at a car dealership. And then I did a little research and it sounded like something that I'd want to do. And uh, so I called a few dealerships applying or, or trying to apply for finance manager position and they all said you got to sell cars first so i um put it off for about a year said no nah, i don't want to sell cars you know not not really interested in selling cars and then uh another year of driving trucks i said man i gotta i can't do this anymore so i uh, learned a little bit about car sales and so, you know, let me go give it a shot. You know, that's what I got to do to get into finance, which I later learned is called the box. <laughs> it's like the that's worst name do. ever, isn't it? Like it's really the worst name ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't understand it. Uh, but I say, okay, if I got to do that, go into finance, that's, that's what I'll do. And then, uh, shoot, got into it. And for four years, I, I stayed in it. So that's how I got started. That's my origin story. Once, you know, that's for, I think for a lot of people, it's like, you know, I don't think anybody ever grows up as a young child and go, you know what I want to do when I grow up, I'm going to sell cars, you know, like, I feel like we all kind of fall into this, you know, like accidental or, you know, somebody of somebody that you knew was doing it. I mean, that's how I got sucked into it. You know, I had a roommate of mine go, Hey Jay, you like selling shit, don't you? I was like, yeah, I like selling shit. You know, they're like, yeah. oh, you like cars, right? I said, I love cars. He goes, how about we sell cars? <laughs> Little did I know he got a $500 referral bonus if I worked there for over two months. Um, and so everybody in the dorm was selling cars at that point in time. <laughs> but <laughs> anyways, um, Benny, for yourself, how in the world did you get started in this crazy little world we call the automotive industry? <laughs> Well, I as well have always been in sales and I love sales and I got into advertising sales, uh, selling, you know, direct mail and working in the BSC industry in St. Louis and moved on to Yellow Pages, moved on to yellowpages.com, moved to, you know, MDC broadcast television to, you know, broaden my horizon a little bit. And funny story, when I was at the MBC affiliate, uh, my time had kind of run, you know, I felt like I was outgrowing you know, the opportunity that was there and my kind of my passion and where I wanted to go wasn't the same as where the organization wanted to go. So it was a Thursday at noon and I called my gal because I had to do that before I quit, you know, because she said, no, I could quit. So, you know, I was like, all right, hey, she's like, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. So I called the dealer that I was working with and I said, hey, man, I just quit my job. I just wanted to let you know. And he goes, OK, great. I hope you got a plan B. Click and hung up the phone. And I was like, fuck. So I picked up the phone to call my gal back to tell her it might not have been that good of a decision. And the company I was working for had already cut off my company phone. So I didn't have a phone. So I was like, oh, I'm driving 30 miles all the way home. And needless to say, he was just joking. And, you know, he took my call. And 
that's how I started my company and that's where we are now. That's a that's a really good way to get introduced into the industry. Just a big <laughs> sucker punch to the gut and then be like, just kidding. Um, <laughs> well, you know what, guys? Um, boy, are we some interesting times right now. You know, I mean, think about when we all started in this business. Uh, gosh, I... Seriously, I, I, can't, I can't even fathom. In my wildest dreams, would I have guessed, you know, that our industry would have had this many changes so fast. But I think that's a great place for us to kind of start. You know, I'd love to kind of hear what your guys' kind of current norm is. You know, um, Mr. Bowtie Terrence, I'll start with you. You know, what does that current norm look like for you, sir? Uh, well, actually, you know, the, the current norm uh, of the car business, you know, I was laid out for, for, for some time. Um, so then, um, they brought us all back, uh, they brought us back at a uh, salary, you know, rather than commission. Uh, yeah. So the, uh, that salary was, was, was a norm that I necessarily couldn't adapt to. So I said, I'm going to stay at home for a little while until things do get back to commission. So, so I, my norm is, uh, being at home, uh, you know, working on how to, uh, prospect real estate leads. <laughs> so, uh, but it's, it's, uh, the car business is, and I think, you know, I think when, when you use the word norm, I, there is going to be a new norm. Like things are never going to be back the way they used to be. Um, and so like there were, there were a lot of, you know, the way we were doing business at the dealership, um, before I said, you know, I'll just, I'll personal furlough myself until we go back to commission was that, um, it was, you know, and I, and I had grown, I said about a year into my, you know, sales career, I had transitioned over to internet sales. And uh, one of the pains of being an internet salesperson is hearing, get them in. Are these people here? Get these people in. And, and you know, and if your people aren't at the store, you know, their file or, you know, their desires or whatever, their purchase gets put to the back burner. And so that has kind of changed a little bit now where well, it had to, because the CDC was requiring, uh, you, you couldn't do test drives and you had to, um, it, we, we couldn't take fresh ups. So it was a point by appointment only. So that get them in mentality. Um, w- it, right. So all these people, so you had, you know, they, they were considering it, uh, well, you know, we got to work things backwards now. But, it, it, you know, that should have already been the norm because that is the way people had already wanted to buy cars. Uh, so w- what should have already been the norm is has now become the norm. Uh, so I that's guess that's to, so that's so totally true. You know, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, really what our current norm as far as how we're able to actually engage with the customer or sell to the customer is the way the customer has been asking us to do it for a long time. And I guess it took a pandemic to kick us hard enough in the ass as an industry to say, okay, okay, okay. I'll let the customer yeah. kind of drive the sales process and service process. I mean, I, I guess a global pandemic is what it took, um, but I guess there's a silver lining there. And I, I don't, I, I say that lightly because, you know, this, this pandemic has affected thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people in, in some very, very serious ways. Um, but, you know, if, if, as an industry, there are some advantages. There's some silver linings, and that is definitely one that you know I will have to applaud our industry. Look, in the last sixty days, I think as an industry, you know, that is not known for changing, <laughs> like or evolving ever, you know, <laughs> like you know, with dealerships had to do some serious changes, both from a technology perspective and a customer interaction perspective, in sixty days, and they never have in the probably in the last. You know, 60 years, right? But uh, before we get any farther in the conversation, I want to ask you, Benny, and kind of give me get an idea of kind of what your current norm looks like for you, sir. I don't like that my gal took my office. Two people working at home with a kid and shit. Like, it's just, it's just, I need to go to work. I'm a mover and a shaker. I'm an outside guy. I'm in stores all day long. That's, that's what I do. I'm comfortable in the store. That's what I do. I, I guess I'm blessed in a way because in the St. Louis market, we don't really, we never had any store shut down. We didn't have anything along those lines. Yes, a lot of, in you know, the St. Louis County areas, we are by appointment only as Terrence alluded to previously, but in a lot of situations, 
you know, most people still want to come in and purchase the vehicle. They still want to do that. So, you know, everybody's dressed up like it's the emergency room, you know, or like beekeepers or whatever it is, you know, and I, and I respect that, you know, and our audience that made you mad or offended you, but I respect, that. you know, if people want to choose to die then go choose to die, that's on you. You know, life's about choices. At the end of the day, you know, we thought that, you know, General Motors rolling out the shop click drive or, you know, using Google Boo for digital retailing or doing this or doing that. And it was all going to change. You know, one of my biggest dealers is, that's out there has only delivered one vehicle online in the past two months. And everybody else comes to the store to buy the vehicle because they want to touch it, smell it, feel it, you know, all those things. So my new norm is Yes, we have to take precautions. Yes, you have to respect the customer a little bit more. But the thing that is confusing the shit out of me right now is all my volume dealers all of a sudden are focused on gross profit. I'm like, what? Oh, the motors isn't giving you the incentives. You don't have this shit. So now you can't give these joints away, you know, and get 2,500, you know, once you hit your goal, give them away for 1,500, just call it a day. You know, so that's the thing that, you know, it's like, whoa, whoa really? You, you want profit? Like, it's not a race to the bottom? And it's kind of cool because, you know, I have a CDJR dealer out there right now that in the first five days of May has generated 60% of the total gross that they generated in 2018 and 2019 in May, in the first five days. So I'm like, great for you guys. You know, that's amazing. But we do cater to the customer more. You have to cater to the customer more. And, you know, this world, it, it, it's a democracy. You know, we, we don't have a dictatorship. You know, this, this isn't, you know, communism or anything like that. So give people a choice. Give people a chance. And you'd be surprised. I mean, it's not like, you know, a relationship with your spouse or your girlfriend where you say, hey, where do you want to go to dinner? And you sit there by yourself for 30 minutes in silence. It's actually when you give the customer the option, would you like for it to be delivered? Would you like, you know, for us to come pick the vehicle up? Would you like to come to the store? They're actually, you know, slightly decisive and they'll tell you what they want. So, you know, I don't really think in my Midwest market that we've been impacted as much as, you know, larger metropolitan markets, East Coast, Chicago, L.A., you know, things like that. But yeah, at the end of the day, damn right, man, you got to pivot. You got to change with the times. Well, and, and I think for the core, that is what we're saying. Change with the times. And, you know, the customers changed. But to your point, Benny, the, the customers changed for a while. I mean, you know, they, they're so used to being able to do their shopping and their research and, you know, just get to the point where all they got to do is just press a button for the transaction portion of it. You know, I mean, I, I'm with you. I, like, I don't think people don't want to go into a dealership. I just don't think they want to spend four and a half hours in a fucking dealership. You know, like, like that's, that's what I think it is. It's like, you know, it's just like, how much of this can I just do from home and then go into it? I mean, like right now, you know, it's like my local grocery store will deliver groceries. Okay. But I choose not to take that option. I'll order the groceries online and go pick it up because I want to get out of the bloody house for a little bit. I mean, help, dude, I haven't worn shoes for like two weeks. You know, like, <laughs> like, like I want to get out of the house and get a little interaction, you know, but, but it's a minimal interaction, right? So all I got to do is kind of go in there and say hi to the tellers. Here's my name. They bring over my order, you know, and then I'm done. I'm out, right? I'm not going to the grocery store. I'm walking up and down the aisles aimlessly, you know, for three to four hours, you know, hopefully not three to four hours. But, <laughs> but I don't think people want to do that at a dealership anymore. You know, and they haven't for a while. And as an industry, we've had a change. So I think what it is, and I want to get your guys' thoughts on this, is that, you know, maybe what it is is this pandemic has actually shown us that the customer's expectations all right, are not here, but they're really up here, you know, and we need to gap that. We need to meet them. We need to meet them at where they're expecting, and they're expecting to be able to do majority of their shopping or majority of their of the research online before they come into it. But I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts on how the customer has changed and how as an industry do we meet with those changes? Uh, Mr. Bowtie Terrence, I'll start with you and Benny, I'll ask you the same question. When you, when you say change, you mean change over time or how have they changed since the pandemic started? Yeah, I mean, I think over time and then how the pandemic's just kind of highlighted it, right? 
Yeah. So I, I think, uh, you know, and I have, you know, I'm still fairly new to the car business, you know, only been in it for four years. So um, how they've changed, you know, maybe since uh, how Benny, I'm not, I'm not sure how much experience you got, but I'm sure from, you know, from 10 years ago to today is a lot bigger change than from when I've been in it. But I, you, you know, you mentioned uh, being able to order groceries from the and then have them delivered. I, I did that for a while. I did not want to grow. I, I hate shopping. So, you know, it, it'll, it takes me 30 minutes in a grocery store and I don't want to do that. And, you know, uh, so there are a lot of people who don't want to go spend four hours until the dealership. They want to get it done beforehand. Um, what, one of the, and so I think this pandemic has, is going to push the industry forward because now we've been forced to learn how to do that. And I think before, you know, you know, there's a lot of decision makers who have been in the car business for a long time prior to the internet. And they never really grasped the understanding of how to close somebody over the phone versus using a four square or however they do it in writing, you know, uh, one of the thing that when I, you know, I'm, I'm fairly new, you know, and um, to the car business, but I'm not new to sales. And one of the things that uh, a lot of the you know old car dogs say, you know, when, when I would come back with my pencil, they say, hey, you, you ain't writing, there's no, you ain't ri ri writing nothing on here. You know, it's like, so I don't, I mean, I know there's sometimes you have to, but there's a lot of, that you don't have to draw graphs and do all this stuff to get somebody closed if you do a proper investigation so if you ask the right questions whether they you know if you ain't asked the right question before they get to the pencil you ain't done your job anyway so it no matter how much stuff you put on that paper so i think when you over the phone and even via text message you know i i was told for the longest do not give somebody numbers in on in text message um but you know I've closed a lot of people because I gave them numbers on text message. And that's, that's, I think is how people have changed. You know, they don't want to talk on the phone. They want to text, you know, you, if you send a, a text message to an elite that inquires, Hey, I got your inquiry. Uh, the, the vehicle is still available. Do you prefer a phone call or a text? Uh, probably 90% of them are going to say text. So, so you can either try to force them to talk on the phone because that's what, that's where you're strong at. Or you can get stronger at closing via text message, and I think this this pandemic is going to change the industry more than it is going to change customers. No, I'm with you. I mean, I think you know, for the customer pushing us to meet them where they want to communicate, and by doing Absolutely. so, what we do is we we create transparency. Like the customer actually feels like they got the information that they wanted in the first place and we weren't hiding something in those graphs and squiggly lines. And I mean, shit, like I, I hated getting numbers of penciled from my manager. He's like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he also, I swear, was like doctor in another lifetime. Yeah, the worst handwriting in the world. I couldn't tell if it was a, I mean, I remember I sold a car one time for like $1,000 more than I was supposed to, but that's because I couldn't read his damn handwriting. <laughs> and, I, and I was just like, it was, but, but no, I mean, what we're saying is, is that the customer wants to communicate in certain ways. All right. We need to let them kind of, you know, lead the dance now. Uh, but Benny, I'd like to hear your kind of thoughts on how, you know, as an industry, we have to now meet those customers' expectations. And where before it was a good idea, now it's a mandate. What are your thoughts? I think what it really boils down to is the, the term have to's. And I always say, I don't have any have to's in my life. I don't, I don't have to do shit. I don't. You know, <laughs> I really don't like that for real. Like that's how I am. Well, now the customer doesn't have to do shit either. Like they want to do it. You give them options. Like Terrence was talking about. Would you rather, you know, take a text message or would you rather me call you? You know, I had a dealer call me the other day. I know you're not supposed to get leads or new, you know, acquisitions and clients during the pandemic, but they are happening. And he said, "Yeah, Benny, I called you three damn times." I said, "Oh, for real?" He goes, "Yeah, I left you two voicemails." I said. Who does that? I, I don't even check my voicemail. I'm like, why don't you just text me? But at the end of the day, if you give the customer the option, the transparency and the no have tos, you have to come in. You have to sign 87,000 pieces of paper. You have to be here for eight hours. You have to do. Come on, man. That's what makes people not want to do shit when you tell them they have to do shit. And if you're not transparent with them, that's how think about every kid out there. Don't do that. They go over there and do the same damn shit you just told them not to do. 
it's it, that's natural human behavior. So I think that's the big thing for me as an individual. I've never sold a car. I love the car business. I've always sold advertising and marketing. I'm familiar with the automotive business and I keep learning more every day. But my job right now is to pivot and be whatever it is that I need to be as far as a utility player for my clients and my dealerships. You know, if normally I wouldn't be on the phone with Hertz going, okay, you guys are going out of business. Look, send me that shit over so I can see how much inventory you have because we haven't had production in two months. We have no Silverados on our lot. You guys, oh, you don't have any, but you got Tahoe's with 31,000 miles on it and you're going to drop them for 32 grand. Perfect. Give me eight of them. All right, cool. So I'm sitting back going, what I thought we were doing pay per click. What the hell? But you know, at the end of the day, like you do, you have to, or you have to want to pivot, and you know, really, if you appreciate people, if you take, you know, the best step to make people feel like they're coming to the table with some leverage, and they feel like they got a fair shake. That's just relationships in general. You got to pivot with the times, and I really think it also, you know, it. It comes down to your audience and your geographic area. I know some hillbilly ass dealerships out there that still got a double truck in the yellow pages and their phone blows up all day long because that's what works for them and their audience. You know, so you can't really blanket it. Yes, the pandemic has, you know, made a huge impact on everybody out there, whether you like it or not, or if you're, you know, living under a rock or your head's in the clouds, it, it has. The successful folks, you know, they're, they're really, it, eating a piece of humble pie right now and going, man, I, you know, I think I'm going to take this a little more serious and, you know, it, it might not be a bad thing that we're changing with the times. It's fear and lack of knowledge. And in my opinion, that's what it's always been in the automotive business for change. However, I mean, if you got a good team. I think you can do it. And I know we can do it. Well, I'm with you, Benny. I mean, I think right now, you know, you're going to see as an industry, you know, from marketing people to salespeople to managers, you know, the cream's rising to the top, you know, like in the past, I felt we've always been a little fat around the belly, you know, when it comes to our marketing efforts, to our sales efforts. I mean, how many times I heard a dealership say, just get me a warm body. That hell's, hell's a warm body. Like that's what you want on your floor, you know, but like, I mean, things are clearly changing now and and i and let's actually talk a little bit about marketing and branding because that's a big part for both of you guys and benny i'll start with you on the marketing side you know what you know from a marketing message you know what what message should a dealership have in play right now i think ultimately it we've already trans, transitioned away from covid 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 that's that's all the shit that everybody sees whether you like it, you don't like it, you believe it, you don't believe it, you, you get tired of seeing and being waterboarded by the same message over and over and over. Okay, great, it's reaching frequency. I get that. I understand that. But ultimately, right now, the messaging is about the customer. The messaging is about what's in it for them. Y yes, you know, so you're doing this, you know, you're doing that to help people, to protect people, to make people safe, to give people an option to make sure that they have the ability to receive a text that you know to receive an email versus a phone call but ultimately you have to make the consumer feel comfortable i firmly believe in consumer leverage if they feel they're bringing something to the table then you're more you know apt to get a better deal a better review a better relationship a repeat and referral customer things along those lines but the messaging is just be transparent, just be yourself, just be genuine. If that's how you are, just be you. And, and it, it really doesn't matter what is going on. If the message is genuine, authentic, and people believe it, you're good to go. Ain't that the truth? I mean, really right now, I mean, customers want to know how much you care about them before they're willing to listen to what you got to offer. And, you know, I mean, as an industry, that's a fundamental change for us because, I mean, come on, guys. We, we are literally, you know, we, we are, I mean, the reason why they call it the used car announcer, you know, or this, you know, it's like the, you know, huge discounts, low lease rates, you know, like it's, 
It, it, we've been doing it for you know seventy yeah. years, you know. But like yeah. it, it is. I mean, it has to change. And and actually, I think one of the things that do have to change, you know, is not that we're just we're marketing to the customer instead of at the customer. And Benny, that's really kind of what you're what you're driving at here, right? Like it's you know it, it's identify who the hell you're talking to, and talk to them as talk to them as an individual. I mean, whoa, shit, that's a novel idea. Um, but you know, I mean, Bowtie, I mean, Mr. Terrence, y you you do this. Um, either knowingly or knowingly, you've been, you, you made it, you made a brand out of doing this, you know? And so right. I, I think that's what it is. I think for a lot of dealerships, they're, they're looking at, you know, brands like yourself, you know, a brand like yours, you know, survives things like this, you know, right. it, it's because you're not constantly having to go back to that water well of marketing and continue to fill up your bucket. Your bucket is constantly overflowing with your branding efforts. So, you know, you know, for yourself, you know, um, for the people out there that are listening, you know, what kind of advice can you give them about, you know, creating a brand and trying to get away from that crack addiction they have called marketing? <laughs> uh, I think is you have to just do it, you know, <laughs> like, it, you know, it's like, it's not a real, like, I mean, there's some strategy involved, but, you know, you, you don't know what your strategy is until you get into it. Like you can't, there's no way if you, for you to have a strategy to do something that you've never done. Like you don't even know what to do. Um, so like when I first, like I didn't even, I had no intentions on building a brand or a strategy. I just wanted my customers to remember me if they didn't buy and they came back to the store. So, so the guy with the bow tie. And then I wanted more people, you know, I, I didn't want to be the best kept secret. That's what it was, you know, I didn't want to be a secret. So that's why I started doing videos so more people couldn't know of me, you know, and then next thing you know, it's a brand, you know, I, it, it wasn't nothing that I tried to do, but if you do, th it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what you do, if you do it consistently, it's going to become a brand, you know, it, it could be like, you, you, Jason, you don't have to say one thing about your orange tie, you don't ever have to mention it. <laughs> that's, that's true. But you you can't forget your orange tie like whoever whoever's on your podcast or whoever sees you you can go through the drive through at McDonald's five days in a row or five days in one week the next week if you don't go through the drive through they're gonna know like so when you come back and say hey where you been because they, you don't have to say one word to anybody your orange tie is gonna do it and and whether you you know if orange was your favorite color or you did it intentionally or not is going to happen because you did it consistently. So that's my advice. Whatever you decide to do, just do it consistently. I, I'm with you on that. And it, and it does kind of have to be you, you know? Um, right. <laughs> I would love to tell you that my orange tie was some like amazing, great idea I had or something <laughs> like that. But actually it was pure dumb luck um, or accident. I, I uh, sold sold my, my Mitsubishi dealership and started the agency and I had to go to a conference and I didn't have a business card. Uh, so the only graphic designer I had at the time, I was like, I need a business card. He's like, well, okay, what do you want it to look like? I'm like, I don't give a crap. Just make me a business card. <laughs> so she made me this business card. It was a, a black card with an orange logo. I was like, huh? all right, that stands out. I'll roll with that. I got to the conference and forgot all my ties. I'm like, I can't go into this conference without wearing a tie. This is embarrassing. You know, so I went down to the lobby of the hotel I was staying at and there was this high end men's clothing store. I was like, ah, shit. I'm going to go spend like 200 bucks on some stupid, ugly ass tie. Damn it. And I was like, no other place. Like I couldn't walk and drive. I was like, I, and they're like, they're going to they already start serving breakfast and stuff. I'm like, crap. I'll walk into this store. And sure enough, I see this orange tie at the side of my, I'm like, that's the same orange that's on my, my business card. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'll go, I'm gonna go. All right. If I got to buy one, I'll buy one. It was like 150 bucks. Um, and I bought that orange tie and I, I haven't stopped wearing an orange tie since then. Now these are not $150 orange ties. These are an Amazon 1999 special. I, I ordered 17 of them all at once. It was the max order I could put in. <laughs> but, but, but you're right though. It's consistency. You know, it's, you know, because I consistently wear that, I consistently wear the orange shoes, you know, I have the orange car, you know, it's like, you know, I can roll, roll up to a place, I can do what I do, and people just recognize me. But it's also, it's it's how you execute on that. It's not enough that you just, you know, wear the bow tie or wear the tie, right? right? It's it's what you're doing and how you're executing behind it, you know? I mean, you know, your passion, you know, one of your passions, you know, Terrence is rapping, you know? 
It has nothing to do with selling cars. Like, absolutely (laughs) nothing. You know? (laughs) But, all right, you have shared that passion with a lot of people, and there's been a ton amount of people that have engaged with you because they also share that same passion, and they've followed along with you for that brand, and you've told me in the past that people bought cars from you because they remember, you know, some of the videos that you've put out and stuff like that. You know, so it's, 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 it's being who you are, you know, as an individual and consistently executing on that. You know, for me, it was just, I like marketing, even though I just called it crack. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Same, <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Benny, for yourself, you know, um, when we're talking about branding, and I, I like to kind of continue with that because I'm thinking, you know, for dealerships moving forward, like this is going to be the best bang for their buck. You know, it's like they got to weed themselves off of the PPC game and, you know, build a brand, you know, they'll have to use some of their PPC dollars to do so. But, you know, what are your kind of thoughts for dealerships out that are watching, listening right now? Maybe a couple ideas or strategies you might have on building a brand. Building a brand is so super important in a couple of different ways. And the, the number one thing that I always say is you can advertise with your own audience or with somebody else's audience. So you're on Google or Facebook or whatever it is, you're paying to show your ads to their audience. If you build your own audience, you build your own brand, you build your own reputation, then all of a sudden your marketing dollars and you know, your cost per advertising per unit or whatever your budget is, it obviously dramatically decreases. It also allows you to have the creative freedom to be genuine, to be authentic and for people to relate to you. And once you earn somebody's trust, you, you kind of got to fuck up a lot to ruin that trust. Because, like, <laughs> us, like, you, you, like, I don't care what you say. Like we were talking about rapping just a little bit ago and people are always like, you know, Pac or Biggie. I'm like, Oh, you know, I don't know what to tell you, you know, but then I'm like, are we talking rap or hip hop? Cause that's two totally different games. However you want to do it. But at the end of the day, when you build your brand, you build that trust and you build that relationship with people. And that's what you're known for. I think that is what is the big competitive edge and the big differentiator from a lot of people. And like I said before, you don't see franchise car dealerships popping up on every corner like CVS, Walgreens and digital marketing agency. These guys have been in business 20, 30, 40 years. So respect the legacy, respect the brand and build off of that giant foundation that somebody else has already built for you. That, that, that is so true. I mean, and, you know, our brand, I think a lot of dealerships think that our brand is something that we have to build. And Benny, I think you're kind of alluding to it. Our brand already exists. It is just in the eyes of our customers. It, it's how we're perceived, you know. So, you know, you may like it or not like it, but the brand of your business already exists. It could be bad or good. But I think what it is is an industry, though, that we have to decide that we want how much we're going to enhance that perception. You know, so it's like someone does business with me, you know, what was it easy to do business with? Did I was it was it fast? Was it was it fun? You know, because if those are the words that a customer will describe, then that's what my brand is going to be about. You know, but I think too often we don't spend enough time to actually define what our brand is. We let just our customers kind of define our brand through the reviews that they post on our website some definitely better than others for sure um but but i mean benny you spend a lot of time i love the videos that you do man where you actually sit down with the customer right like you let the customer kind of be that differentiating factor you know for that dealership i'm curious how in the hell did that start man where'd you come up with that idea i just I got, it was more of a have to thing. You, the, the customer, when you're buying a car, it's your second largest investment besides your home. Okay. That, that shit makes you happy. It does. You're spending a lot of money. on It's kind of a big deal. You know, it's like your, your first kid, no disrespect to my second kid, but you know, you're like, I'm having another kid. When you have your first kid, you're like, I got my first kid. You're all excited. So People want to share their joy. They want to share their passion. They want to share their experience. They want to share their purchase. They want to share all these types of things. And at the end of the day, let them share it. They're going to share it. There's a button on every single social media channel called share. Let's utilize that. Because one of the best ways to get your message out without any type of investment behind it is a share, is to have people engage 
those things. So put it out there and let the customer speak freely. Let the customer explain to you what it is. I'll walk into stores all the time and there's customers sitting there and they'll walk up to me and go, hey, can I do a little review real quick? Can, can, you, can you get me on camera talking about my experience? I'm like, what? I thought we have to make you leave a review before you leave the store on your phone or it's going to be bad because you won't re- get the fuck out of here. It's okay. Let people have the option to do what they want to do and they'll come back time after time after time and sing your praises. And, and you know, that type of content is real proof in the pudding. You know what I mean? Like it's the real proof of what makes that dealership different and it's coming directly from that consumer. So I love that you do that and I thoroughly enjoy watching them. Um, hey, you know, on the line of communication, you know, we talked about what we should be communicating to our customers. You know, there's something, guys, that's been honestly rubbing me the wrong way and i've been kind of wanting to get you guys the thoughts and opinions of this and you know it's almost split down the middle 50 percent of dealerships are doing a good job 50 percent of them i find are kind of doing a shit job at it and that is how we're communicating to our staff you know it's one thing to communicate to our our customer database and i think as an industry we know the importance of that and we allocate a fair amount of time and dollars and efforts and whatever it is to to that and then I, I had to say it though for i think for a lot of dealerships out there we really fall short on how we communicate you know to our staff and i think because of this pandemic it's become even more obvious you know i've i've talked to a bunch of salespeople, you know and other uh, staff members that have been furloughed or laid off and they haven't heard yeah. anything from their dealership in two months no communications but then i've talked to other ones and they're like uh yeah i uh, have um you know almost every other day I have a conversation or we jump on a zoom call with my manager, you know, and he's talking about this and where we're going in the direction. So it's like, I'm, I'm beginning to see real leadership right now. You know what I mean? Um, but I would love to kind of get both of you guys' thoughts and opinions kind of on how and what we should be communicating to our staff right now. Um, Terrence, I'll start with you. And then Benny, I'll ask you the same question. Um, well, I think the, one you know thing that we could be communicating or should be communicating to you know our staff is that um you know we're a team you know first and foremost um we're going to um we 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 are pre like i guess i don't know the gratitude i don't know but basically so there's there there should be um you know that's because there's still a number of people who are afraid you know to go to work, let alone go out to purchase a car. There, there are people who are afraid to go to work, but they have to because of bills. Um, so uh, there are, you know, just to be to be appreciative. Um, so some kind of a gratitude to the employees showing up to work is a, is greatly uh, appreciated and a message that should be communicated. No, I'm with you. I mean, you know, I mean, look, I, I, for a lot of dealerships, I think, unfortunately, sometimes we put the customer first in front of our staff um and i don't know i actually i actually kind of disagree with that you know i mean i I think our staff before our customers is kind of the mentality we have to have because our staff the the i'll tell you this the the happier the staff are the happier the customer is i it's just it's it's just i've seen it that way but i've never seen it the other way around (laughs) you know um but you know to your point terrence you know i mean i think that's sales managers do need to be you know showing their gratitude for their team it is a team for crying out loud right like you know you have a solid team of people and you're, you're expecting that team to come back and execute at a level like they were before this all went down i mean shit you're right terrence you better be showing some damn gratitude man i'm I'm right there with you on that message thanks uh hey benny for yourself um you know communicating to you know staff what's your thoughts and opinions of what we should and how we should be doing that i agree wholeheartedly with terrence and obviously you know that you are appreciated campaign that you know we did and things like that is that's the number one thing that me as an individual i will you know run into a wall for you if i know that you have my back 150 percent if you respect me you know if you appreciate what i do you know i I don't need the attaboys and pats on the back every day i just need to know that you're going to be there with me in the trenches i also think one of the big things is is 
people seem to gravitate more towards individuals that teach them something or educate them on something. So, you know, if you, if you have a greenhorn on your staff that is scared to death to come to work right now because of a global pandemic and you're like, you know, Hey pussy, you better come up to the store or you're not going to have a job. Like you, you can't do that. Whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, you have to respect that individual's feelings. You have to respect that individual's placement and their beliefs and their stance. And, and I think that's one of the things that it's, it, it is, you know, a two-sided coin like you alluded to. There's dealers out there that treat their people like numbers and they're dicks to them. And you're just a number. You're replaceable. You know, whatever. Okay, Beyonce, I get it. But at the end of the day, you still have to make those people respect the fact that they care about you. They're coming to work for you. They're coming to make you the money. And if you treat everybody like a number and say, oh, I don't care. You guys can all quit and we'll be fine. You actually won't. Because you're not out there walking the lot. You're not out there desking deals. You're not out there doing all the shit that they're doing. And you're not the one that's out of your comfort zone standing there with your cell phone in front of a 2017 Acura MDX doing a walk around, scared out of your mind. But you're putting yourself out there and making yourself vulnerable. And that was some funny shit the other day. I saw this a sales guy. His name's Brett. I'll call him out. He had never done videos before you know he's a floor guy been there 20 years he's old school and he did this video and he opens the, the door of the equinox and he gets out he looks at the camera and he goes hi now this guy's like <laughs> 60 you know and and i start dying laughing and it's like a 10 second pause and then he, he goes right into it but we were all like man that was awesome you know we laughed with him you know did this and that and you can't look, you can't do anything but give that individual gratitude, appreciation, a thank you. At least you're putting yourself out there and you're trying. You're right. Pay for effort. Pay for it. No, I'm with you on that. You know, and it's it's it, it, I, I think education is a great opportunity right now. And I'm seeing some of the best sales managers that I know out there are, you know, pushing their team to be educated. I mean, I, I know one sales manager that bought, you know, some virtual books. And because I guess you can buy them on Amazon, and actually send them as a gift, you know, on Audible. So, you know, like he was, that's what he was doing to give back to him. You know, I actually had one dealer principal. I think you guys would love this because I, I've, and I talked to him, I met a lot of dealer principals over my career. And, you know, they, a lot, for the most part, a lot of them do refer to their staff as family. But it's times like this that you actually get to see what the hell that actually means to a person. So, you know, over the weekend, I, I called him to see what he was doing. And I could tell he was in the car. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm, I'm uh, visiting uh, my staff. I said, oh, that's cool. I didn't know you guys were open today. Well, we're not. You know, I'm driving door to door. I said, excuse me? And, and I'm like, what are you doing? Well, he goes, I, I got a bunch of bottles of wine in the back. Um, I got coloring books for the kids and uh, a, a few other things. And I said, I said when did you do that? She goes, dude, I've been doing this every single month. Um, I do it right around the middle of the month, you know, and I just go and I, you know, I, I put it on the porch and I stand outside and I just wave them and say, I hope you guys are doing all right. You know, uh, cheers, you know, <laughs> but, but like that, that, that's something family does, you know, yeah. like that, that's, you know, that's really being a leader. That's truly being a real operator. And when you're saying that, you know, your staff is like family, that's treating your staff like family and, and, and going as far as, you know, doing things like that. He's gone as far as actually picked up groceries for some of his staff, you know, because he's got a couple staff members that um, are diabetic and they're immune compromised, you know, so he didn't want them going out and he said, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do it. And the cool thing is now all of the team has now kind of done it. So now even some of the other sales managers are driving around and they're talking and they're visiting and they're dropping things off and everyone seems to be offering everybody a helping hand. And I, I am so excited for when this dealership is back in full force because I'm going to tell you right now, that team is going to be a force to be reckoned with. I mean, I'd actually be scared to go buy a car at that dealership because I don't think there's any way in hell you're getting out of that dealership without buying a car because that team is just so tight. You know, they're they just so tight right now. I'm super excited to see them back into it. 
Um, but I think there's some great examples. And hey, guys, I, I know it's getting towards the tail end of our time today. And I know that we could jam for probably a whole nother hour. But before you guys go, I could ask my favorite question of the day. Now, I prepped both of you, so I'm ex- I have high expectations of you guys. Okay, so uh, Terrence, I'm going to ask you first, Mr. Bowtie Terrence, what yeah, is yeah. pissing you off? Uh, I guess, um, shoot, you know, it's, it, it, we are talking about the car business, so... <laughs> <laughs> how much time do i have <laughs> like i <laughs> i think i guess I, I would say the number one thing um that pisses this pisses me off and you know i am the ultimate team player you know i'm like f- football background from an early age up through you know the uh, major college football player you know i've coached little league kids so i understand the importance of team and I know uh, one of the most important aspects of having a good team is making sure people are in the right position. Um, and I think one, one of the things that I see the most in, uh, you know, and I say in the dealerships, but I've been at the same dealership, but I've had four general managers. And, you know, as the general manager changes, so does the store. So I, I, wait, four general yeah. managers in four years? Yeah, absolutely. Dang, dude. So we, yeah. <laughs> I think we need to get your dealer principal on the podcast. So, so I've had you are so, appreciated, so, shirt. <laughs> so I, I've been, I've been in four dealerships essentially, um, and in each time, uh, one thing that I have seen is that people are not put in positions that best suit them. Um, like you, we'll have you know maybe somebody will get a shot at on the desk, but the desk is not necessarily for them. Or, or you know maybe they excellent great salespeople maybe finance should have been their promotion um so people will be promoted into positions that don't fit their strengths and then they fail um so uh I, I, you know and just watch you know I, like i've watched people that i you know have relationships with fail because they were put in posi- in position that didn't suit their strengths um so uh that is and and i've i've watched people who deserve to be the you know be put in positions and they weren't um, because they had weaknesses in areas that had nothing to do. Oh, I think we lost you there, but uh, Hey Terrence, I mean, I, I, I hopefully you can still hear me, but man, I, I'm totally with you. I agree. I agree with you on this. You know, uh, it's, we, we, we have to put each person in the position that they're warranted to be in. You know, it's, I, I, unfortunately, you know, I think we use more politics on how we decide who gets put in what position. It's not necessarily what they can actually execute, but I will say some of the best dealerships I've ever been in have operated more like a professional sports team where they where the management and ownership truly does understand the talent or even the potential of talent in each one of their staff members and put their staff members in a place where they can actually strive and grow and better not only themselves but the business itself too all right benny you are up man benny all right benny mazer what is pissing you off Right now, what's really pissing me off is the vendors and third parties that only fucking care about money and they don't understand the whole situation. Okay, so let's break this down real quick. Okay, I'm an auto trader rep. Cox Automotive laid off 12,500 people, 10,000 of them are in the United States. Cox Automotive owns the auto. They own Mannheim. They own the fucking transport trucks. They own all this shit. There's no production going on. There's not inventory going on. But you're going to come in and try to upsell me on some shit? What? I don't give a shit about advertising or marketing. You can have it all. But if I don't have a product to sell, you're useless to me. Have a little compassion. Do a little research. Understand a little bit. Put yourself in my shoes and pivot and understand what's really going on. Most of the time, if you have a relationship, the other principles will cut your fat ass check if they trust you. Right now, you can't sell a product that you don't have. You can't. You can't. That's that's so, so true. 
and just do something just but that shit right now it just bothers me just look at it from a holistic point of view look at the big picture because this is way bigger than you mr media seller out there and i'm involved in that as well you know as an agency owner i get it but at the end of the day realize what's going on a lot of these dealers they're, they're not choosing to cut their budget by 75 percent they're not choosing to cut their sales volume by 75 percent and they're certainly not choosing to just say, well, fuck it, this is just what we're gonna do. No, it's bigger than them, it's bigger than you, and that's what's really going on. So that kind of pissed me off, sir. No, I'm with <laughs> you. I mean, I, I, I get a little pissed off right now with some of the vendors out there that think that, yeah, but, but it's 50% off, so why wouldn't you buy it? It's like, man, do you have any freaking clue or any empathy for what is going on right now? But I, I'm with you. I'm with you on that one for sure. Uh, hey, guys, for everyone out there that's watching and listening right now and would love to connect with you two fine gentlemen, what is the best way to do so? Uh, Bowtie Terrence, I'll start with you. Uh, well, I actually uh, got a URL, bowtieterrence.com, and it takes you to uh, – you know, there's a little button on that that says save to contacts, but there is links to all of my social media profiles, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, even my website. So just bowtieterrence.com and how, however you want to connect with me, you can. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect, man. <laughs> hey, Benny, for yourself, what is the best way to connect with you? You can call me 314-879-4049. Benny Major, I'm lucky. There's not a lot of other Bennies out there, but that's me, Benny Hill, Benny and the Jets. So if you Google that shit, I'm probably going to come up. If you put mm -hmm. something cars or automotive or dealership or something like that, email me, whatever it is. You know, LinkedIn's my preferred platform, you know, social media. So that's probably where you're going to find the most of my content. But yeah, I mean, reach out any way you want to. However I can help you, that's what I want to do. Hey guys, uh, thanks so much for taking the time to jam with me today. This has been a ton of fun. You guys have yourself an awesome day.